<laughs> How badly did I whack that up? Hi, I'm Steve Albini, and today we're going to be talking about miking speaker cabinets. One of the first things you need to decide when you're putting a microphone on a cabinet is physically where to place the microphone. That is, what part of the speaker you're going to be pointing at and what distance you're going to be working from. So considering the placement of the microphone across the face of the speaker, the center of the speaker cone is going to be moving in and out of the magnetic gap the most accurately. That is, it's going to be the most tightly controlled by the mag electromagnetic effects, and the movement of the center of the speaker is going to be the most accurate representation of the input signal. As you move out toward the perimeter of the speaker, there are a lot of other effects that creep in. The speaker itself can ripple or crumple. There can be a harmonic mode generated around the perimeter of the speaker. The mechanical installation can uh, cause noise or damping. All of those things argue that the perimeter of the speaker is going to be a less accurate representation of the input signal than the center of the speaker. And all of those things argue for pointing the microphone toward the center of the speaker. Now, those things, those irregularities, do contribute to the sound quality of the cabinet and the speaker overall. When you're listening to a loudspeaker, you're typically listening at a distance. So if the guitar player is fond of their guitar sound, that normally means that they've been hearing it at a distance and they like the sound of it at a distance. So to capture that sound, that argues for backing the microphone off from the loudspeaker slightly. There's an added benefit to that. When the microphone is very close to the loudspeaker, it's hearing all of these eccentricities at, uh, at, their, most, at their highest level. And also the microphone can be exaggerating one or more of these eccentric sound effects. There are also internal cabinet reflections, that is where the sound is bouncing around inside the cabinet, and where the sound is bouncing off of the mechanical frame of the speaker, and those short reflections create comb filtering effects and can dull the sound quality. Um, as you move away from the loudspeaker, all of those effects sort of sum into a, a general cabinet sound. That is, the sound of the cabinet as, at a distance is where all of those effects have combined and summed into a single sound, which you can identify as the sound quality of that speaker. So if you are trying to capture the sound quality of a specific speaker cabinet, um, my default is to start with the microphone at the center of the speaker and then back it off to a distance where I can hear with my ear that the effects of the local resonances and oddities of the cabinet have sort of combined into a single sound. That translates to a working distance typically of 12 to 14 inches for a guitar cabinet. Um, for a smaller amplifier system, like a small combo amplifier, the working distance can be a bit closer. Let's go into Studio A and I'll show you how I set a microphone up on a loudspeaker. No! So this is the amplifier that I want to put a microphone on. I put it up on this chair so that it will be closer to the working height of the microphone stands and I won't have to stoop so much. And whenever I do that, I like to secure a small amplifier with a strip of gaffer tape on the front and back of the amplifier so that the working vibration of the amplifier doesn't cause it to move off axis from the microphone. The first thing I need to do is figure out where the center of the speaker cone is if I'm going to put the microphone in front of it. A couple of ways to do that. If you put your hand around the back of the small amp like this, you can feel the center of the magnet on the back of the speaker. And if you point your finger there, you can put your finger in a corresponding position on the front, opposite that other finger, and that'll find the center of the speaker. You can also just look through the grill, but if you can't see through the grill, you can use a light, like the one on your cell phone, which will show you precisely where the center of the speaker is. And once you've found the center of the speaker, you'll know where to put your microphone. Now this microphone is going to be at a working distance. And it can be difficult to tell at a working distance whether you're on the center line of the speaker or not. So what I like to do is I like to bring the microphone right up close, line it up with the center of the speaker, and once I'm certain that it's lined up, I can move it back along that axis to any working distance. Now this mic stand is, all, is adjusted all the way to the bottom. 
and it might seem that I wouldn't be able to get this microphone in front of the center of the speaker. But there's an extra little adjustment here. This screw, which is normally used to collapse the mic stand for storage, if you loosen that, you can lower the center post of the mic stand and get even a big microphone like this down in line with the center line of the speaker. Now that I'm centered on the speaker, I can move this back to any working distance. Oh, wait a minute. One more thing. The working distance of the microphone can have a tremendous effect on the sound quality. You can use this to your advantage to improve the sound quality of a thin or weak sounding amplifier, for example, you can take advantage of a principle called the proximity effect. All microphones exhibit this characteristic, some more than others, but at a closer working distance, you tend to get more low frequency response. That's the proximity effect. Figure eight microphones tend to have more proximity effect than directional microphones. Omnidirectional microphones have the least proximity effect. So, as the microphone gets closer to the loudspeaker, it exaggerates the low frequencies. And if the, if the amplifier sounds kind of weak, kind of thin, then you can beef it up slightly by using a microphone with a greater proximity effect. The microphones with the greatest proximity effect are those that are in a physically large housing. As a microphone gets close to the loudspeaker, the polar pattern is created by the sound striking the front of the, loud, uh, front of the microphone and some of the sound traveling around to the back of the microphone. And the inter interference of those two is what creates the polar pattern of the microphone. If the microphone is in a physically large housing, that is if it's a ribbon microphone with a large magnetic armature, then the sound gets to the front of the microphone, the working element, fairly quickly but it has a relatively long distance to travel to get around to the back of the microphone. That tends to make the rear pattern less in, uh, as the microphone gets closer. That is, microphones tend to lose their directional qualities the closer they get to the sound source. Uh, and it also tends to exaggerate the proximity effect. So for the greatest proximity effect, you would use a bi-directional microphone say a ribbon microphone, with a large magnetic armature that is a large footprint because that would make for the, the greatest acoustic shadow and the most exaggerated proximity effect. Let's go back into the studio and I'll show you some more useful microphone techniques. A normal working distance for me for a cabinet like this would be 12 to 14 inches, something like that. If I wanted to emphasize the low frequencies using the proximity effect to make this amplifier sound bigger or heavier, I can choke the microphone right up on top of the speaker. Proximity effect on a small combo amp. <laughs> Okay, this is a bass amplifier. Uh, in this instance, it's for a bass guitar, but it could be for an electric keyboard, uh, an organ, uh, um, electric piano, a Rhodes, a, a Wurlitzer, synthesizer, any of those instruments that needs a good bass response. You could be using a bass amplifier for live monitoring. With any of those instruments, it's important to record the lowest frequencies with accuracy. So I tend to use a microphone like this, the Bayer M380. It's a microphone with good low frequency response, but it's also a figure eight microphone. So I can move it very close to the speaker and take advantage of the proximity effect to extend the low frequency response. So this microphone is going to be very heavy in low frequencies, and I can be certain that even the lowest notes are going to be accurately recorded. Now there is high frequency detail coming out of the amplifier as well, and if you lose that information, you can lose the articulation of the notes. So I tend to also use a brighter microphone like this, the Sennheiser 421, and record them simultaneously with their diaphragms aligned so they stay in phase. Then in the control room, I can balance these two microphones against each other and synthesize the most accurate representation of the speaker. 
you can think of it as something like the woofer and tweeter in a hi-fi speaker, where you have one driver that's covering the low frequencies and another one that's covering the high frequencies, and the blend of the two of them gives you the most accurate representation. Buyer M380, low frequency response at close distance. <laughs> Sennheiser 421 high frequency detail. Both mics. This is a little tiny amplifier. This is a ribbon microphone, the STC4038, with a figure eight pattern and a large armature. So it will exhibit, exhibit the proximity effect and the acoustic shadowing that I described earlier. At a normal working distance, this microphone will be picking up the guitar from the front lobe, but the rear lobe will be, be picking up the free field ambient sound of the room. So if I want a more ambient sound off of this signal, I can just move this microphone back. The front lobe will still be picking up the direct signal of the, mic of the amplifier, but the rear lobe will be picking up relatively more of the ambient sound in the room. So you have a great deal of flexibility with the placement of a microphone like this, changing the character of the sound. If I bring it up close, the acoustic shadow and the proximity effect will exaggerate the bass response of the amplifier, making this small amplifier sound bigger. At a normal working distance, I'll get an accurate representation of the sound of this amp. And if I move the microphone a little farther back, I'll be using more of the rear lobe of the microphone and less of the front lobe, and I'll get a more, a more ambient sound. <laughs> My performance. This is a bigger cabinet with two speakers, with multiple speakers in it. And that gives you the option of using multiple microphones on different speakers. The speakers themselves might be different with different sound qualities, and you may want to record them separately. Or you may want to take advantage of different sound quality microphones, either for balancing later or to synthesize a stereo image from a mono signal. In this case, I have a ribbon microphone here and a condenser microphone here. The ribbon microphone will be slightly darker, slightly heavier. The condenser microphone will be slightly brighter, slightly, uh, slightly more high energy, more high end energy. Fuck. Anyway, I've also got a microphone at a distance picking up the ambient sound in the room. That microphone is over there by the conga drum. I have this microphone on the floor so that its pickup pattern, normally omnidirectional, becomes hemispherical. That is, it's picking up the reflected sound from all the surfaces in the room above the floor. It's not hearing any of the reflections off of the floor. Those would be near field reflections which would cause coloration of the sound. It's a good practice when you're putting a microphone on the floor to put a stand or, get, uh, or some piece of hardware over the top of the microphone. Acoustically, it's basically transparent but it prevents people from stepping on the microphone accidentally.
A combo amplifier, like this AC30 or a Fender Twin, sometimes has two speakers. Now you can record those two speakers independently, or you can record one of them. But if what you're after is the overall sound of that amplifier, at, a, at some distance away from those two speakers, the sound of them sums into a phantom center. That is, if you're close, very close to the cabinet, you can hear the two speakers discreetly. But if you back up just a little bit, you'll find a point where between midpoint between those two speakers, you're hearing both speakers and the whole of the cabinet at, from a single point. That phantom center is a good place to put a microphone if you want to use one microphone to pick up that amp. You can find that center by crouching down and moving your head back and forth, and you will be able to hear very clearly the point at which all the sound from the cabinet sums to a single point. And that's how you know where to put this microphone. I'm not gonna do the jumping thing that started to hurt after a while. Okay. You may have noticed that in these demonstrations, the microphone position relative to the speaker cabinet is end on. That is, the plane of the speaker cabinet is parallel to the plane of the microphone diaphragm. Um, when I first started working, I didn't know what I was doing, and so I mimicked the practices of other people that I'd observed. And it was a very common practice for uh, a speaker cabinet to be mic'd from the side with the microphone coming in at an angle. Uh, if this is an overhead view of the cabinet, the microphone would be very close to the speaker and sort of angled in from the side. Uh, and when I tried that mic position, I found it unsatisfying. It didn't sound that clear. I felt like I was uh, reaching for the equalizer often, and I started to think about why it didn't sound that good and experimenting in with moving the microphone position. And I found that when I had the microphone more perpendicular, the sound was instantly brighter and clearer and sounded better to me. Um, and if you imagine the, the plane of the speaker uh, emanating sound this way, and if the microphone is at an angle, then the angled diaphragm of the microphone is going to be getting sound across it at, at slightly different times, and that's going to cause some phase cancellation in the very high frequencies. Uh, and indeed, I noticed that when I had the microphone in at, an, at an angle, it sounded duller and less precise to me. But if the microphone is perpendicular to the plane of the speaker, then, you know, within a very small error, the whole of the diaphragm is being hit by the sound at the same time. Um, and I believe this practice was derived from um, live sound engineers having to keep the stage uncluttered in front of a speaker cabinet. Um, the area in front of the speaker cabinet is prime real estate for dancing and other kinds of showmanship. Uh, you know, whatever people do on stage. Uh, I've never been on stage, so I don't know. Rather than put a microphone out in the middle of the stage where it could get kicked, Live sound engineers developed the practice of having the microphone off to the side of the speaker cabinet and then sneaking it in at an angle so as a kind of a defensive maneuver. And then that just survived as received wisdom into the studio. Um, and all of my practices in the studio are derived from an iterative experimental process. I would try something, and if it didn't sound good, I would try to think about why it didn't sound good, and that would guide future experimentation and until eventually I developed a set of practices that I think are durable and uh, versatile and can be used in a lot of different situations. I encourage everybody to experiment with their studio practices because that's how the profession grows and matures. 
we get better at things over time because we're bad at them at some point and we stop doing that. 